Friends, when we eat something fantabulous, you know, like we always, there's an anxiety going, you know, what is the ingredient in this recipe? Same thing happens for any successful transformation. That needs to, there are some key ingredients that are part of it. Our next speaker, he comes with a 21 plus years of automation and agile experience. His interests are cloud computing, applying machine language, and intelligent automation. In his free time, he loves singing, listening to music, and playing outdoor games. Let's not waste our time, and we'll roll on, and let's welcome Venkat Monkopo for the session, Automation, a key ingredient to a successful agile transformation. Thank you, Vaidya. Thank you. Am I audible back there? Show of hands. OK. So uh, thank you, Vaidya, for that introduction. Um, so the hobbies like singing, amateur astronomy, and uh, outdoor activities are aspirational at this point of time. Because I, because I have a wonderful daughter who's just turned two. And I'm sure I love, uh, many of you can relate to this, because I spend a lot of uh, quality time with her. And when she grows up, she's going to listen to this, audio, uh, this recording. So let me see, quick say, uh, quickly say hi to her. Hi. And uh, with that, uh, let me get on with the presentation about um, automation, which uh, I believe is a key ingredient to successful agile transformation. But having said that, uh, let me set you up for some quick disappointment. I'm not going to talk about automation, and I'm not going to talk about transformation. They are both very vast topics. But then there is some relevance um, in the way I'll be talking about some of the ideas that I have experienced in the next 30 minutes or so that you could relate to and probably build on and take it with you when you encounter uh, any of these opportunities to transform your business. So again, the standard disclaimer, these are my views, um, nothing to do with the organization or the people. And you, uh, you are welcome to disagree with me. So the way I've structured this presentation uh, is by looking at why we do automation. We know, quite a, all of us know why we do agile, because it gives you a lot of benefits. Um, and there is a context in which they work very well. Similarly, automation also works very well in a certain context. And we'll see some of that. We'll then look at some of the challenges faced by the businesses today as they transform. And then what may be some of the details of those IT functions in trying to align with the business outcomes when it comes to transformation. So how can we then influence those outcomes? And lastly, how do you know you've succeeded by looking at some of the measures and metrics that really matter? So why do we automate? We, pervasive computing has become so commonplace that the, the devices that we encounter in our daily life, like smart TVs, smart phones, smart watches, and so on, have become ubiquitous in the sense that there's so much computing power in all of those devices with such complexity that they enrich our lives in so many different ways. And added to that, you also look at, you also have Internet of Things, connected kind of ecosystems of these devices, sensors, actuators, and so on, that take so much of data back to the cloud or to the internet on which further computing can be done. And that further enhances our lives in so many different ways. And naturally, with these devices, you have large amounts of data, rich, very, real time, fast, and requiring quick feedback. So naturally, we have two different <coughs> sciences or technologies that have matured in the last few years that have become you know, mainstream, so to speak, which is data analytics or machine learning and artificial intelligence. And they look at topics such as data mining, predictive analytics, pattern recognition, facial recognition, learning, problem solving. And they've seen them not only in products, but also in the, in the service sector, where, for example, you see smart meters in the energy sector, like smart meters, smart grids, that help you optimize costs of consumption of energy. In, in healthcare, where you look at uh, diagnostics, predicting uh, certain cells from terminal cancers, in clinical diagnosis, in telemedicine, and also in, in the insurance and manufacturing industry from vehicle telematics. There's a lot of information coming in that's disrupting some of these businesses. 
So vehicles constantly send a lot of information about how quickly you drive, how fast do you accelerate, how do you how effect, how strongly do you brake, and so on. And that you know in turn is used by these insurance companies to help you uh, reduce your risk or reduce the uh, the premium and in turn their risks. And also in in the BFSI space like fraud analytics and also looking at claims processing and underwriting. So what these things have done, this coming together of devices, smart computing, and the maturing of those two areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning, is that they've disrupted businesses in, in fundamental ways in which they work. And they are being disrupted every day. And the businesses are realizing that there are new business models that they can tap into, and they can also create new and improved value or revenue streams for their customers. So let's look at, sorry. So let's look at some of the details of a traditional business, or at least the way we have known them, and the way the, the business or the IT functions are aligned to those business goals or business objectives in order to appreciate the complexity we live in and why transformations are important or needed. So back in 2011, um, there's this author uh, who came up with this term, systems of engagement. Does anybody know who that is? I'll give a clue. He's the author of the book, Crossing the Chasm. How many of you have read it? Show of hands, please. Amazing. It's a very good book. You should read it. Uh, he's a thought leader. His name is Jeffrey Moore. He's also the person behind uh, the innovation of diffusion um, of uh, new product introduction model, as you call it. Much like the Gartner hype cycle, which you probably have heard, he has also classified how users are either laggards or early adopters or innovators and so on and so forth. It's a very good book, and I recommend that. So he came up with this term, systems of engagement. Um, at about the same time, this was 2011, at about the same time, um, businesses started to look at their own systems of data and, start, uh, uh, and companies like IBM started calling their own set of data systems of record. How many of you have heard this term, systems of record, versus systems of engagement? Okay. So this dichotomy of systems of engagement and systems of record was popularized by a Gartner, um, who's an analyst you probably know, by a paper by these art, uh, Gartner analysts who said that there are fundamentally two different systems in the enterprise. The mode one system and the mode two system. And the mode one system is the traditional system, which is more stable, more reliable, less likely to change, or slower to change, um, and are highly governed, and so on. Whereas the mode two systems are the ones that are more agile, more friendly to failure, more adaptive, less governance, and most friendly in terms of the agile context. But there's a fundamental flaw uh, that these, this approach or this paradigm has brought in the industry. And there have been a lot of uh, opposition, or if you will, difference of opinion with this approach taken by Gartner. And that kind of resonates with me. So I was reading uh, on um, the opinion given by Jess Humble of Continuous Delivery Frame. How many of you have heard of him? Okay, another great book if you're an agilist and a great author, uh, Jess Humble. And the title of the book is Continuous Delivery. He's, by the way, going to be speaking at the Agile India conference next year. He was here this year as well. So he, he has fundamentally three different, uh, three things that he has to say as to why he disagrees with this bimodal IT, as it's now come to be called. The first one is that it seems that Gartner analysts are basing their mode one and mode two, the bimodal IT, as mutually exclusive in that you've got to trade off reliability and stability if you have to be agile and nimble. That is a fundamental flaw. We know from experience that many of our agile transformations or agile systems are also reliable and stable and we have corrective ways to improve even if they fail or be adaptive as quickly as possible to recover. The second thing is that because there are two different speeds of systems, one that is the systems of engagement, which is more agile and nimble, versus the systems of record, which is much slower, you need to have artificial constraints of sync points between the two systems if you really have to build together an end-to-end -end flow of data, of information, flow of value across the business 
life cycle. And the third thing is that this is absolutely, it, it is quite reductionist in approach. And so Gartner in response perhaps uh, came up with this third layer called system of differentiation and later on they adapted it to systems of intelligence with all this artificial intelligence and machine learning buzzwords coming in. They decided to put insert another layer. So like a band-aid on top of all the, the damage that's already created. But then, you know, call it what you may, these systems of intelligence are the ones that are making your interactions with the touch points in the business cycle so much richer. We have heard so much of talk about what systems do, how we engage with enterprises, how they provide value to customers. So call it what you may, call it however you classify them, unless you have a customer focus through customer journey maps and focus on customer experience in delivering customer value, because ultimately that's what keeps you in business. If you don't have any of those, then you probably lost the plot and your transformation is not likely to succeed. So moving on, what are some of the challenges that we're facing? Now we've got our idea about why we need to automate, because there's so much of data and it's just humanly impossible to be manually going through all of the data to provide value to customers because there's ubiquitous computing with so many smart devices, internet of things and connected devices and so on. We also looked at some of the traditional systems and the way they, they've got systems of record and engagement which have not really worked very well or at least have got internet. Uh, the, system, the other thing is that the systems of record are tuned for internal efficiency rather than in external effectiveness and that's a challenge as well. So you need to refactor, change the ideas about what you can get from those systems of record because they don't give you a unified view about your customers which is why the systems of engagement and the systems of intelligence are going to be giving you much more value in the overall business IT landscape. So what may be some of the challenges? Another question. How many of you have heard this term VOCA? Show of hands. Okay. Good. Quite a few of them. So for those of you who haven't heard what it is, they stand for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Now this term was first coined at about 2002 by the US War College after the 9-11 incident in grooming the next level of leaders to address the asymmetry in dealing with global terrorism. Our world is no different in IT. We see so much of volatility, so much of uncertainty, and there's definitely a lot of complexity. And of course, ambiguity, because we have to deal with quick responses. We don't have all the information to decide rather quickly. And we have to rely on systems to give you data-driven decision making that will help you transform effectively. So uh, there's also another um, A that's later got added, got accelerated disruption to, you know, to, identify, to specify what the interesting times that we live in with the, um, with the systems um, that are disrupting our business in the, in the ways we really you know, work with our customers and add value. So we've talked about technology, we've looked at uh, what's disrupting uh, our business uh, models and things like that. But then a lot of people focus on strategy. Classic case, um, in uh, the Apollo 13 uh, launch, and you might have seen the movie, very popular movie, they had to quickly readapt and change their strategy as soon as they had an incident. And that was the explosion of the secondary oxygen tank. And this strategy from you know, landing on the moon or circumnavigating the moon to find a suitable place for later moon landing had to be changed to bring back, has to be changed to a different objective, and that was to bring back the astronauts safely home. <coughs> we live in a similar world. We do not know what's uncertain, what's going to happen next, where the disruptions are going to come from. And Peter Drucker, uh, the management guru of the last century, uh, famously said, or is quoted to have said, that strategy, a culture eats strategy for breakfast. So we think strategy is going to solve problems, but then culture needs to be looked at as well, and probably more, with more importance. And the leaders of tomorrow have to have strategic thinking as an imperative, and, they, and that key leadership skills become very important. Because your disruptions are going to be caused because of their obsessive customer focus. How many of you have heard the term FANG? Show of hands? No? Okay. Any guesses? 
Yes, the back. Right, you're right. They are the digital companies, or the bond, uh, the bond digital, or digital natives, as they call them. The Facebooks of the world, the Amazon or Apples of the world, Netflixes of the world, and Googles of the world. They probably don't own any infrastructure, but then they've disrupted the way we, their fund, their the business in which they are operating, the domains in which they are operating. So that's that's because they've got one cultural thing that's common across all of them, and that's their obsessive customer focus. Another question, how many of you have seen on Amazon website a phone number to call a customer service representative? Have you ever looked at it? Have you had to call them? Yes? Yes. You've seen it? Okay. That's interesting because I haven't seen it. No, it's, it's, they call you back. Exactly. They call you back. You wouldn't find a customer representative call number. You, you either have to interact with them through the medium and then they'll call you back or you have to do some other ways of getting it. I had a personal experience with that. Um, I've been an Amazon customer from about 1996 when I was in the US studying, doing my graduate study in a university and then Amazon had just come. Windows 95 was really new, it was 1996 or 95 rather and uh, Amazon was just selling books and uh, those were the days we had printed books right? and uh, I had to get some, um, a particular book for a course that I was auditing out of interest. Um, this book was out of print because it was published first in 1987 and uh, I couldn't find it in the library. It was there in the library but it was almost always checked out because it was so popular. And even if you get it, if you're lucky to get it, you can only keep it for two weeks and you have to return it. And with a busy schedule like in a graduate school, you couldn't really complete the book in two weeks. So I was very desperate to get copies of the book. Of course, photocopying the entire book was out of question because of copyright violations. And the cost, of course. Uh, and uh, so Amazon came along, and I was looking for this title of the book. And sure enough, it was there, but it said um, out of stock. But then it had, an, it had a call to action button that said, would you be interested if you find it kind of a thing? So express interest or something like that. And I did. So it gave me a text box where I commented and said, you know, even if you find it in bad shape, would you be willing to take it kind of a thing? And I said, so um, I said, uh, yes. And then that happened. Uh, many months passed by. I graduated from school. I went on to start my career. Many months later, um, I got an email from Amazon that said, you had expressed interest in this book. We have found this rare book somewhere in Europe. Uh, it's in very poor condition. But then you have restored it to readable condition. Would you, and this is the price, by the way. Would you be still interested in buying it? And I said, sure enough, yes, because Amazon has this great policy of no questions asked returning policy, right? Without any questions, they'll take it back. So I was going to take a chance. And the price was not expensive. It was the price at which it was being sold, or comparative books were sold at that time. And they came, the book came. I opened the book. There was this slip inside that said, uh, we found this hard to find book or out of stock book. Um, and we restored it to good readable condition. By the way, it was brand new. I still have it. It looked like very new. There, none of the dog-eaten corners or anything like that was beautiful. It was restored in perfect condition. I was so delighted. After all these months, they found the book, traced it somewhere in Europe, shipped it to me in the US, and I got it for a price that is reasonable, very reasonable. And so that's customer experience. And to me, that's customer focus. I had a very bad incident as well, so let me narrate the other thing as well. How many of you know how frequently Amazon deploys to production? Any guesses or anybody knows? Okay. I have, yes? Any different? Okay. About 13 times in a second. They have automated deployment. That's not about 11 seconds. It's about 11 times in a second. And this was two years ago. Okay. Uh, so the level of... Uh, confidence with which they go to the market. And I don't know if you, any of you heard Christian's talk earlier about XP, where he flips the uh, waterfall model, deploys to production, then goes back to start testing and all that. Perhaps that's what Amazon does. I, I have no clue, how can you really, because they've, got, they've mastered this idea of infrastructure as code, microservices, mastered the idea of masters, uh, 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 microservices, and they are able to containerize all of their aspects of uh, their functions. 
the thing is that with this thing they are also willing to take a risk there is a potential risk that there are untested code going to production and that's possible and that happened as well so you heard the nice side of the story with Amazon of my experience with Amazon this is the not so nice story that I'm going to narrate now so I think last year it was or year before I don't remember we had they had this um, uh, the the bonanza the sale bonanza or what they call it the festive sale yeah so I'm a prime customer by the way so um, I wanted to buy something during that period because you get a significant discount on some products and uh, I tried to check out and I couldn't check out imagine what happens if you can't check out that's the way you monetize really that's and you have an idea you got everything else up to that point and you can't check out you're not re realizing the money that you've almost always almost got this customer caught on to right and sure there was Flipkart but they didn't have the sale at the same time and their prices were not competitive so almost they've got a monopoly and so and there's no custom service right I can't call somebody and say I can't check out and your sale is ending in two days right I tried it in the morning I tried in the evening I tried the next day it's not working I got frustrated right and it's very easy in this digital age to get frustrated unless and it, it takes seconds to get frustrated because we live in an era where millennials rule the world and our emotions are also you know like that we've come to accept that level of ambiguity and uncertainty right and sometimes in a negative way and so I took to Twitter and said I have this problem can at least Amazon have the courtesy to call me back because when I put in this note nobody called me for about seven eight hours I was frustrated sure enough they said you know send me your uh, details or DM me and I'll give you the D I will try to get in touch with you and finally it got resolved a couple of year, days later because they were trying to ask me questions leading questions about uh, are you did you change the shipping address did you change the pin code or anything like that being a tester myself I look at all those edge conditions and possibilities and rule them out and I was suggesting to them that the only thing that happened between 1995 when I was an Amazon customer for the first time and last year or uh, this year or a few days ago is that I suddenly became a prime customer like last week and this is the first opportunity I get to check out after I became a prime customer maybe you should look something look at that and maybe see if there's an issue with your code but anyway it got resolved so but my point is you've got to be obsessively customer focused and you've got to change all of the ways in which you work and look at those inefficient inefficiencies in your system so that you can really influence the outcomes of your business transformation so let's get on with that so I'm going to talk about two things which is uh, customer journey maps and value stream maps by no means they are exhaustive uh, anybody familiar with either of them okay some of some show sure fans second one okay. sure so customer journey maps are very concise visual representations of steps your customers take as they interact with and engage with your company or your business uh, and value stream maps on the other hand are steps needed to take from production product creation to delivering it to your end customer so one is outward focused the other is internal focused similar to quality ideas right you build in quality versus you look back at quality right so uh, you know a lot of those analogies you see but then customer journey maps are also the key ingredient that is very essential to tie all of the different systems or different groups of people in your business IT business or IT functions to have a shared vision because you really see where the customers are being impacted what their pain points are what are the emotions that they go through such as they take actions they may have motivations to take those actions and what may be the questions that are coming to them as they go through those spaces and finally what may be some of the risks or barriers to completing their objective like it happened to me in checking out certain things certain products from Amazon dot in right so this is just a represent, visual representation of what a typical customer journey map lo might look like and moving on a value stream map is one where you look at all the internal processes and you see what are the difference between the ones that are value add and non value add activities going through the delivery pipeline in realizing value delivery for your customers from product creation to you know, delivering value or delivering customer expectations so you have these tools that helps you set up these things and you have these challenges with our internal processes but then you also need leaders who can be adaptive to the VUCA world 
But then you also have to think about your team. So I was looking at what is it that works in an agile context? How do agile teams succeed where waterfall fails? So one of the things that led me to uh, my research was uh, 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 an interesting book called Drive by Dan Pink. How many are familiar, have seen it, or read it? You've read it, okay, good, one of them. So he has also got YouTube channels on what really motivates us. And he identifies three things that are intrinsic motivators. They're not money, they're not uh, you know, anything else, um, like the carrot and stick approach that we typically take. It's not fear, uh, definitely not that. It is three things, it's autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And all high-performing agile teams have mastered these three things, in giving these three things to their, to their employees. And they are the key motivators. So combine that with the information that you have, the shared vision about your customer, and the information you have about the inefficiencies in your internal processes, through your value stream maps, and what you have. You have all the insights to create purpose, what is known as purposeful automation. Now I'm going to talk about automation a little bit. Again, not on why you, uh, uh, what, is, what to do, but you know, how you do it. So this term purposeful automation came about recently because you don't go about automating just about every process to bring in efficiency. That's not going to work because there is cost associated with creating those automated processes or automating those processes, and they're not, probably not going to be effective unless you look at those inefficiencies where you want to eliminate the slowness. And uh, th there are three ingredients to the, to, to the idea of pur purposeful automation. And that is, you have sophisticated decision making, you've got automated monitoring, and you have pivot actuals and bottlenecks. So what are these? Let me elaborate a little bit through an example so that you understand what I'm referring to in, in when I say purposeful automation. And that is, take the case of barcode. Now, in, in uh, the retail industry, people looked at, uh, looked at the value stream maps, the customer journey maps, and came up with uh, and identified areas of inefficiency. And clearly, the checkout process was not that, you know, it was slow, it's sometimes frustrating, things like that, right? And we still see that even today, um, people getting doubts about the, the prices of things. We recheck our bills and so on and so forth. But what this... Um, barcode did was basically revolutionized the way you do the checkout so that it reduced the friction if you will in completing your, your sale it optimized your inventory and also improved the value delivery process the experience of customer as they delivered value in, che in, in checking out a certain thing at the, at the checkout counter so that's a classic example of how a, so a technical solution Optimize, optimize to automating at the appropriate time, in this case the pivotal point of checkout, has helped improve a lot of the business insights or you know, realization of value, managing your inventory and so on, and elimination of waste of course. So let me also talk about two things that I, one of them is my personal experience, the other is the other experience from what we have seen in the media about systems of engagement. That's the easiest point at which you can digitize you can bring in automation and improve customer experience. And that's also the first place where you can easily lose out and damage your brand. And the first instance on the left is the Uber screenshot from my, my phone. A couple of months ago, I was at the Marriott Hotel for a, for a meeting. And I was trying to find an Uber ride back to my office, which is in Niyati, uh, in Aravada. And so I typed in Niyati, and then sure enough, it popped up. Uh, what is the screenshot you know, showing me that there's a real estate place in, I think it's the UAE, and it's trying to offer me a ride all the way across the sea. I'm not sure the Uber cars can take me through the seas, but then that's what happened. Uh, so in their agility and their quickness, their search algorithm somehow got confused and showed me a place across the ocean. And I, I understand when I took to Twitter, which again, is classic of a millennial because whenever you have these frustrations, you went out on Twitter and see if you can narrate or relate with someone else who has a similar experience. Uh, I, I believe this is not too uncommon. The second is Mr. Roshan Agarwal. I, I didn't hide the name because it is already in public domain. A few months ago, he was flying Indigo to Hyder to I think Hyderabad, yeah, Calcutta, and then I think his luggage went to Hyderabad, 
and with a sarcastic comment took to uh, Twitter and thanked Indigo for that. The problem here is that you have these automated systems with AI and machine learning that are not good. They are not good in sentiment analysis. Right? So you can do transformation, but it won't give you the outcome. <laughs> so that's what happened there, right? So what can we do, really do to measure the value or when you know that you really succeeded in transforming, right? So uh, there are many surveys about effectiveness of transformation. So let me call out or quote uh, this one. So Gartner in 2019 did some survey, this is this year, and they found that of all those transformations, only 4% of organizations did not have a digital initiative, which meant 96% of all transformations had a digital component. Yet, of those 96%, only 50% of them had any metrics. Alarming. How do you even measure? How do you manage what you cannot measure? Right? And there was this other survey by Forbes in 2018 that showed about 70% of failures. Now, there was a similar study last year by IBM that showed this number as 84%. So I took a conservative one, which is Forbes list. And so it's alarming that all these transformations fail for various reasons. And I think one of the reasons is that you don't have the ability to measure your transformations and take corrective actions whenever they don't go well. So to me, there are three things. The first is how digitally proficient you are. And ways, and I'm just citing a few of them. You can probably have other KPIs. And then by no means you know, prescriptive, you may have other KPIs that may work well for your organization. So this is just a snapshot of what has been published by many other companies that works for them. Some of them may be you know, measuring your digital revenue, your brand value, spending in digital, how much you spend that you do in digital, and what each of the departments contribute to your digital revenue. The second is customer focus. What's your net promoter score? What may be the changes in the customer experience across the channels in which you engage with them? We saw in the earlier slides, some of them not so happy. And then what, what may be the reduction in time to market? How quickly can you adapt to the market changes? Amazon is a great example. And what is the rate of customer acquisition? The last one is return on investment. All businesses are there to make profits. They're not there doing charity, right? So what may be the revenue from new product introduction or service introduction? What may be the number of in innovations in your concept to cash value stream? What may be the profits that the new product introduction or service is providing to your business? And finally, what may be the number of services or products that have introduced by class of customers? Customer segmentation is very important when you look about, talk about customer experience or user experience. So those were the things that I think are relevant when you think about automation in a transformation context. There is complexity involved. There are challenges ahead. We need to redefine our businesses or get disrupted. So with that, thank you very much. Open to questions. Thank you, Venkat. Uh, friends, any questions for Venkat? And these questions will be time boxed. Uh, don't worry. Uh, Venkat will be available in the Tavinsa room. There is a discussion bar. You can address your queries over there. So please, please be seated. Please be seated for a minute. Uh, any, any questions for Venkat? Just, just wanted to check out what, what do you mean by digital revenue? Is there a new word? Sorry, I didn't, haven't heard of it earlier. This one, the first one, right? Yeah. So um, if you look at the balance sheet, or uh, lately, when I say lately, um, as recent as a few years ago, companies, service companies, for example, um, I used to work for Cognizant before and actively follow their reporting. Um, and uh, they started classifying some of the revenue, or the type of revenue, in, the, in what they call quality of revenue. So things that are the smack stack you might have heard of, which is um, you know, social, mobile, analytics, and cloud computing. So any revenue that can be generated or attributed to any of these channels or these types of uh, value stream delivery is attributed as, or quote unquote, as digital revenue. So that's what I was referring to. That's one way to look at it. There may be other models as well. But this was something I've heard. There was one question at the back. Yeah. yeah uh well, one question certainly was, uh, you mentioned about a specific book from Jeffrey Moore. Can you specify the name of the book? Crossing the Chasm. Crossing, crossing the Chasm. C-H-A-S-M. Okay. Crossing Thank the you. Chasm. Uh, 
and then as far as the automation part is concerned, um, certainly a lot of content which you presented was surrounded towards digitization. Yes. If, if, if I can say so. Yes. Uh, the question to you is, while there is this advancement which is happening in technology with, with a rapid pace, if you had to think about the mindset yes. for the leaders to adopt, yes. uh, what would be your suggestion? How uh, and different organizations would have, uh, and I know there cannot be a straight answer to this question, but, but you, uh, the examples which you quoted were from Facebook, Amazon, and, and these kind of companies. But at the same time, there are companies uh, who are from traditional domains of, uh, let's say, automotive domain, which are now focusing more and more uh, on uh, electri electrification and uh, digitization. So for such traditional mindset companies, if they have to embrace agility and change and, 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 and the rapidness with which the, the technology giants are progressing, what would be your suggestion? What are the key uh, elements that they need to focus on? Uh, it's a very, very broad, very, very loaded question. Uh, any transformation is difficult. Changing people's mindset is even harder. Um, having said that, I'll speak from my experience. There are three things that uh, come to my mind quickly. First is, there's a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. Uh, she's a professor at MIT. Amazing book. And I would recommend all agilists to read that book. She talks about a dichotomy of fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And I would like you to look at that. Second, uh, there's, a, there's a series of articles by starting with why. If you look at TED Talks by Simon Sinek, he talks about starting with why. And you really understand the purpose. The third thing is, of course, I covered the autonomy, mastery, and purpose by Dan Pink. Those three things, as ambassadors of Agile, and evangelists of Agile, I would imagine that you know, we have to address this particular problem that you're talking about at all levels, across the leadership, and top down, bottom up, any which way you see, and message them and re reinforce the value of these contextual things that help them do the transformation. I don't think I can answer beyond that in this limited time we have. 